This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the gorgeous, the talented, the funny, Nikki Kramer Alpert. Yes, the gorgeous, sexy, tr- uh, jeep-driving nightclub party girl in the cult classic Earth Girls Are Easy, celebrating its 35th anniversary. She'll be my second guest and second party girl from that movie. My first was Stacy Travis about five years ago. Uh, Nikki has an awesome, awesome podcast on uh, YouTube called the Nikki Alpert uh, Podcast, where um, she talks to people about deep issues that she's interested in, including sex, which I am so friggin' excited about. And um, she guest starred on Days of Our Lives, The Fall Guy, and Divorce Court in the 80s, too, when she was an actress. I want to find out why she left acting. She's uh, mostly working in salons uh, doing hair, ironically, which was a theme of Earth Girls Are Easy. And it's going to be a great conversation. We've been talking on Facebook for the last week. And she just seems to have a great sense of humor. And she's not easily offended, which is awesome. I can't wait to have this conversation. Spring April is here. It's going to be a great month. Um, I am so excited and so blessed for the guests that I have coming up. So yeah, here is my interview with Nikki Kramer Alpert. Hey, Nikki, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hey, Tommy, I'm well. How are you? I am fantastic. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Are you kidding? It's an honor to me. Thank you so much for asking me to join you. My pleasure. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? You know, I was raised in the business, um, and so kind of told not to do it all my life, but seeing that my father was very involved, he was um, a publicist for actors and movies and television, Mm -hmm. so I was surrounded by, I was always on the set of things, and got a sad card by, this is a funny story, um, Mm -hmm. oh my god, what's his name? Uh, Shadow Stevens, does that name ring a bell to you Yes, yes, Shadow Stevens. Yes. Exactly. He was like the car salesman, which he wasn't. But one day I was walking into my father's office on the corner of Sunset Tahiti. I was probably 15. And he was like, hey, Nikki, you want to get a sad card? I need a beautiful girl for, you know, I'm 15 and beautiful, like all 15-year-olds are. And I was like, sure, why not? And then I got a sad card that way. And then one thing after another opportunity just came up. And so I went with it. And it was really fun. Wow. So you grew up around the business. Like, who was your dad's, like, crew of friends in the business? Uh, well, there were many, but then, of course, they were people behind the scenes. But he did, like, the first Rocky movie. Um, oh, wow. Doctor was his client, and he did before um, Paramount Television, where at the time they were doing Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and all those shows. Mm-hmm. Before they had their own publicity department, they hired my father to do all of their PR. So I grew up on the set of Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and Taxi, and then he did all of Chuck Barris' television shows. So I was at the gong shows on the weekends, and I was at the dating game, and I was at the newlywed game, and all of those things. Wow! Oh my God! Did you see the crazy? <laughs> did you see the crazy Paramount lot parties that they that those shows would have? You know, I was too young to be invited to the Paramount parties. Yeah. As a kid, you know, my father went to those things. Like I got to go to the Hollywood Christmas parade. So, it was, uh, as inappropriate as Hollywood was, still is, and is trying to work their way out of these days, I was still too young to be invited to some of that stuff. Wow, that's amazing. That really is. Yeah, it was such a, it was was a a, a much different time, smaller community back then, there was no internet, everybody knew each other, it was really, really magical. Yeah, it was, and it's funny, over the years, as I got older and I met people in other places, Actors who I remember I was I was at Joe Allen I don't know if you know what that is but it was a very famous sort of celebrity hangout and lunch in place in Beverly Hills and I had gone there with a couple of girlfriends I must have been maybe I was nineteen mm-hmm. and the waitress brought over a um, a letter from the guy who was on Hill Street Blues Ed oh uh, not Ed Flanders he was on Saint Elsewhere um, oh. 
I, oh, no, I, I can't think of it. <laughs> Me neither, but a very, a very tall, very handsome young man, or of course, not young in my mind, but, but he had asked me out. And I was like, oh my God, how exciting. And I said, yes. And then somehow, I guess somebody there saw the flirtation happening, called my father, and got a phone call, and he was like, I don't think so. <laughs> and so I never got to go out with him. <laughs> you sure it wasn't Ed Bigley Jr.? You sure it wasn't Ed Bigley Jr.? It was not Ed Bigley Jr., that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't find an Ed here on Hill Street Blues. Um, wow. So, so after high school, did you attend college? You know, I didn't. I, um, I decided, okay, this is a total segue here, but in 1984, I, um, I got really sick, and I was in the hospital for a little while because I had become a type 1 diabetic. Mm-hmm. And... Back then, they let me stay in the hospital, and I sort of manipulated my parents, and I was like, no, I've, been, I've had some really good luck. It's been really easy, and I don't want to go to college. I think I want to be an actor. Yeah. And, uh, and I knew what I was doing, because they were so not wanting me to be in the business. And um, I got to be, because they were, you know, because <laughs> I manipulated them. So <laughs> I didn't go to school. I, uh, I went to the School of Hard Docs instead. Did you do school plays in high school? You know, I never did, which is interesting because I went to Beverly High, mm-hmm. and I was school with a lot of people who became very well-known, very talented actors, and these were kids who were talented, you know, very early on. I mean, Johnny, um, oh my God, how am I dropping names like <laughs> uh, One of the boys in my class was doing a play in the little theater at school, which had like, you know, it was like a 50 or 99-seated house. Uh-huh. Neil Simon was in the audience. Wow. And Johnny was taken out of school and put on Broadway. Um, and Nicholas Cage and David Schwimmer and all these people who really studied their craft. But uh, I was um, a young ingenue that opportunities just came knocking, and those were all the jobs I got. I did study a little. In fact, I studied with Jeff Goldblum, and I studied with Robert Carnegie, and I studied Yeah. Your voice is low, Nikki. <laughs> Your voice, uh, your voice went really low for a moment there. Oh, am I back? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I did study eventually, and um, and yeah, so and then I worked a little bit, and it was really, really fun. Were, were, were you there the same time as Claudia Wells? I certainly was, and I'm still friendly with Claudia. Yep, she's a friend of mine. I've I've been to her Armani store, and she's yeah. been she's been on here twice. She's such a good person. I love her. She's a beautiful soul. I love Claudia. Yeah, I mean, she was she was there at the same time as um, oh god, what's his name? I just interviewed him, Patrick Patrick Laberto. Uh huh. Patrick was there, and uh, I don't think I ever met Patrick's brother. Uh huh. Um, David Schwimmer. Oh yeah. Uh, David Schwimmer, who I mentioned, yeah, David was there. Polly Shore. And Polly was there. I was so Polly's older brother Peter was in my grade, and Polly was just a little runt. In high school, you know, and then he became this little hilarious run because he got older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! It's so crazy how many people went there at that same time, and it went on to become so successful. Yeah, and they, well, they had a very wonderful theatrical training for a department there. I mean, our school plays were amazing. The musicals were wonderful, and you know, the parents paid a lot of money for the the shows, and So, so the first credit on IMDb is Days of Our Lives. Everyone that I've talked to has told me that soaps are the hardest job because you have to memorize like 50 pages of dialogue a day, and if you stop, you get fired. They get really mad when you stop. <laughs> yeah, that is very true. They, they, cause they've got a lot to shoot in a very short amount of time, and there are so many people on the set. Mm-hmm. And most of my scenes were in my underwear, so I was, well, I was so nervous <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What other memories do you have from that job? Uh, let's see. Well, well Bo and um, Kristen, the, the story was that I played Catch and Bo's sort of best friend, uh, lover, and crime, you know. And yeah. they all have, we 
all have these matching tattoos of a, of a sword. I had a on my thigh, which is why I was in my underwear all the time, so you could see it. And it was usually in bed with one of them. Mm-hmm. And um, the one who played both white eventually, her name also escaped me. I don't know what is happening with my brain right now. But she and I had the same manager. Uh-huh. Your 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 voice your voice keeps going from low to high. <laughs> That's so weird. I don't have any explanation for that. Let me see if I can fix something better. Yeah, we've been having weird power issues up here. Oh, okay. So is this any better? A little bit. Let's see if this works. I can I can take you off of my AirPods. Let's try that. Should we try that instead? Oh yeah, I can hear you just fine now. <laughs> okay, good. Perfect. Okay. Uh <laughs> Everybody was incredibly supportive, and they were such hard workers. And like like you said, it's by the clock. They are they are every dollar is is important to the time, to the month, to the second. Uh, so it, it it teaches you a very strong worth ethic, ethic and being prepared and all that. You know. Yeah, it's good training. Yeah, very good training. Like theater. Uh, Shannon Tweed, Vanessa Bell Calloway was on there too. Do you have any memories of them? I don't, actually. I only worked, like I said, with um, the guys who played Bo and Patch. And um, that was really it. Nice. Next comes yeah. next comes the fall guy. I love the show growing <laughs> up. How was that experience? Okay, I'm going to tell a horrible story about this. And, and forgive me, but it's okay. I'm on the set. And um, it was a beauty pageant type of thing. And Lee Majors is, you know, completely flirtatious. And I, part of me understood the whole idea of flirtation and sexuality and that it could get you in trouble. But I was, I still sort of felt invincible to it all. Yeah. Especially because my father was powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lee Majors invites me to lunch on our lunch break. And I'm like, well, this is thrilling. So I, I, and I, it never occurred to me that it was anything other than, Oh, you're so pretty, you're so talented, you're so wonderful, let's have lunch and discuss stuff. I, I honestly was that dumb. And I get in the limo, and we are not even at the gate to get out of 20th Century Fox. And um, mm-hmm. and he starts to make a move, and I'm like, hey, I think you know my dad. And then he told the limo driver to turn around and drop me off and kick me out of the car. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the women I worked with were really fun. Being on a show that was, you know, a number one show at the time was totally cool. And my father also worked with Farah, And so yeah. I had met Lee before. Of course, he never remembered me until I told him who my father was. But um, it was funny. It was kind of, you know, working for me because I was raised in that environment was sort of like going to work with a bunch of aunts and uncles very often. You know, even though you didn't know them very well, you knew they were people who were friendly with your family. Mm-hmm. And I sort of felt safe enough to make big mistakes like getting in the limo by mistake. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, that's terrible. I, I've always got this weird vibe from Lee Majors. He just it seems like a, a an arrogant dude. <laughs> I, would, I would say you are 100% correct about that. You have a good read on that. Yeah, it's it's no wonder that, you know, he didn't have longevity of success after the fall guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, but you know what? He was respectful when I put my foot down, so so at some point, you know, he backed off, and that was, and he wasn't rude about anything after he didn't treat me worse or had me kicked off the show. Mm-hmm. So, you know, put your foot down, and ladies, if you're listening, if somebody makes your foot feel uncomfortable, put your foot down, and, and then you can change the whole, you know, the whole spectrum of the thing. Absolutely. And uh, Terry Kaiser was in that episode. I'd met him six years ago. One of the sweetest guys ever to play a bad guy in everything. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember him being very nice. Like I said, I never had a bad experience, you know, mm-hmm. that was that stuck with being terrified me or hurt me on the set ever. And people, and also, I don't, I don't know what it's like these days, uh-huh. but in the 80s, people were generally pretty 
pretty grateful and happy to be working and treated other people pretty well who got the chance to be working with them. Mm, that's so good. Dead Cubs um, Divorce Court. I can't believe these shows still exist or even existed. They are so bad and over the top, you know. Oh, my God. Like, wh what was that at like? Hey, I was playing the daughter of, of a divorced couple. And, mm -hmm. you know, very sad that my mother and father were getting a divorce. And it was my fault. And, and they kept saying it wasn't my fault. And, um, you know, part of me identified with that because I had been through a couple of divorces by that time with my folks. My mom had been married twice, but, you know, so... It was easy to get to that place of being the kid of divorced parents. Um, you know, I never really got to dig my heels in and play a character that nobody could ever imagine me playing. Mm -hmm. And so having been not only a daughter of a divorced family, but also, you know, divorces got really big in the 70s when women's rights took over and all that stuff. When women decided they didn't have to stay in something like the women of the 40s and 50s and 60s did. Mm -hmm. and so all of my friends had been through it, and I'd heard these conversations with other children and, and their, you know, how they felt about their parents. So I had a lot of um, stuff to dig into for that. And, right. you know, was it, was it any worthy performance? I don't think so. But was it fun to do? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the wonderful uh, Twink Kaplan was in that episode. Uh... I will agree with you, but I will honestly tell you that it wasn't like you were there for the whole. Like I had my three scenes on the on the. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it? Where you sit when you're on trial? Uh, that little area where you sit next to the judge when they ask you questions. Under oath. Um, and under oath, yeah. So I had my three scenes there, and then I wasn't there for anybody else's. I mean, even if I was, I was off camera getting lunch or doing something like that or off the set. So I didn't get that friendly with anybody. It was a one day shoot. And my three scenes were all on the same day, and it was easy peasy in and out. Yeah, we 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 had competing um, uh, courtroom teams in in, in 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 my high school and all the rival high schools. It was called mock trial. What happens sure. is, yeah, yeah, you audition for it. You have to memorize this packet that you that you that they give you, you know, and they all compete and stuff. And it's good training ground if you want to go to law school. I don't know if anybody that at least from my era, you know, went went to law school after high school, but a lot of them did it. Um, did mock trial. I, I was thinking about doing it one year, but I was too lazy. <laughs> well, I bet it would have been fun, though. It would have been fun, yeah, especially since I got turned down for the school place because I couldn't sing or dance, you know? <laughs> well, listen, mm -hmm. I, that, that might be why I didn't do any of the school plays because it wasn't like I could sing or dance either. It's not like the 50s where you had to be a dancer, a singer, and an actor. I was just um, lucky in the right place at the right time with the right dad. And, you know, in the new world, I guess I was pretty enough to book some of those roles. Absolutely. You, sh you certainly were. So how does Earth Girls Are Easy come into your life? Uh, you know, I had this great manager, and I think I was an Abrams uh, artist time, and I got the interview. And it's funny because I booked that job, and I think the movie was called Tequila Sunrise. It had Mel Gibson and yeah. Michelle Pfeiffer... And I think Jeff Bridges. And I booked both movies at the same time. Kurt Russell. Week. Was, Sorry? It was Kurt Russell. Okay, Kurt Russell. I yeah. didn't do it because I chose Earth Girls Are Easy instead because it seemed like it was going to be this, this iconic thing and it was so different. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not so sure I made the right choice. <laughs> 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 but, you know, to be an actor and get two jobs in the same week because you could go out for... 500 auditions and if you're lucky to book one because there's a billion actors out there and there's a, a billion ingenues and there's like you, you never know why you do or you don't book the job yeah. and so um, I got lucky enough to book those two and I chose Earth Girls Are Easy and I show up for my fittings and um, I basically was uh, one of three girls who met the aliens after they were shaved down by Gina and Julie yep. become looking more like people and I'm driving a red Jeep on Ventura, and I put him in the car, and we go to a club, and I remember I was wearing this red rubber leotard and a red rubber skirt that went with it. Yep. And I, sh I was on that shoot for a good three weeks inside this very hot nightclub that was, we were there during the day, obviously, and sometimes in the evening. But it was crowded with, you know, cameras and people and extras and everything. And 
I was so sweaty in that thing that when I finally took it off the first day and by the time I was done with it, I still looked like I had it on because I literally got diaper rash in the shape of the dress and the leotard all over my body. <laughs> it was horrible, Tommy. I was so itchy and so uncomfortable for so long. Mm -hmm. And but, but, but again, you know, it was worth it. It was a great <laughs> opportunity, and I would have done it again. Diaper rash and all. <laughs> but it was worth it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it was totally worth it. It was totally worth it. And, um, and interestingly, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with, the people who were the big stars of the show and Jeff could not have been lovelier and I don't know whether it was because he thought I needed more work or he thought it was okay at it all but he was like you should come study with me mm -hmm. he was teaching at the um, at Playhouse West in Burbank on um, Lakersham with Robert Carnegie and um, I got to go and take class with him and so I, I, I learned a whole lot with the Meisner method which is an incredible method if there's any young actors out there buy the book, read the book, and find somebody who can help you with that because it is the most authentic, realist type of acting uh, training there is. It was just wonderful. Yeah. Oh my God. I, yeah, my brother rented this movie when I was six years old and I've loved it ever since. It's just so, That's so scary. Wait, how old are you? <laughs> I'm going to be 40 in June. I was six. In, uh, I was six in nineteen eighty nine when this came out on video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A year later, exactly. And yeah. did you? I'm sure a lot of it went over your head as you watched more and more of it. It became a lot more clear to you what everything was and all the double entendres and stuff. Oh, every movie I've ever seen since I was like two. I, I, I it's been that way. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Gosh, I remember. Gosh, what am I thinking? Um, Oh, cartoons, even Bugs Bunny, like all of a sudden, oh. as a grown-up watching it, being like, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, Bugs Bunny, Disney, oh, my God, the, the racism yeah. they got away with back then, you know? It was it, it was normal to them back then, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Julian Temple, you know, he, he, he had directed music videos for David Bowie and the Kinks, and he even directed David Bowie and Ray Davies of the Kinks in a very underrated musical called Absolute Beginners a couple years before. And that movie should have been a huge hit. It was so good. And, like, you know, Vesteron Pictures, they did they had a huge hit with Dirty Dancing, and I believe in my heart of hearts this was like one of those tax write-off movies where they were like, let's, let's, make, a, let's make a bad movie, but then... They did like it once it was put together. They expected it to be a huge hit like Dirty Dancing, but it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. And this is, I think, his directorial debut in movies and stuff as well. Yeah. And um, he, he was incredible. I remember there's a scene where I am driving um, in the Hello? side of the club, apparently. And it was the... Um, Oh, my God, I, the names are escaping me terribly. Uh, the, what's the, uh, oh, my God, it's a, big, it's a big place in Los Angeles where you look at the stars and stuff. Um, the point? Um, <laughs> the, I'll remember it at some point. I'll just blurt it out like I'm whatever losing my mind. Um, okay. And um, I, I, I never lived in the Jeep, and I come down the, the big, long, winding driveway, and Julian says in my earpiece, hey, Mickey, Let's do this again. Let's, let's, can you get closer to the wall this time? So I'm like, yeah, sure. So the Griffith Park Observatory, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm driving down, the, down this road to get into the parking lot, and mm -hmm. he says, can you take it closer to the wall? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I go down, he's like, okay, we need to shoot it one more time. Just get as close to the wall as you can. Tommy, mm -hmm. I took out the entire right side of that Jeep as I went down the, the, the wall, the driveway. And I get down to the bottom, and I'm mortified. And I'm like, uh, Julian, yeah. am I close enough for you? And he was like, that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Um, yeah. Visually, I mean, the movie looks like a John Waters movie with a little bit of terror vision uh, thrown in there. You know, it's 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 kind of a trademark of Julian Temple. He likes to go elaborate. Yeah, and bright and and loud. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow! So that that nightclub was was super hot then. Oh my God! Well, I don't know how hot it was as far as like you know a big place to go, but inside of it, it was very warm. <laughs> <laughs> I, it wasn't the place I frequented. In fact, in the 80s, 
I was too young to be going to that club. Mm -hmm. Well, AA there wasn't. But, you know, back in the days when I was too young to be there, I was there. And um, I was going to places like Carlos and Charlie's and all sorts of places where, you know, I should not have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was uh, working with Gina Davis like? So Gina and Jeff were newly, I don't even think they were married yet, but they were at least thinking about getting married because I remember we were sitting in the club, you know, at some point all just talking. And they were talking about how they figured that if they had children, that they were just going to be like tall and gawky and get made fun of in high school. And that they were just going to call them, um, I think he said he was going to name his kid Rabbi Goldblum. Because he yeah. figured just give the kid a messed up name, have him be teased for everything. And of course, uh, you know, being a Jew wasn't as scary in the 80s, I guess, as it would be now. Yeah. But, um, or, you know, or back in the day, it was, it was, you know, terrible things. But he was they just making constant jokes about how gawky their kids were going to be because they were so tall and funny. And the two of them together, not just on camera, but they were very silly together. They were, they... They just seem to really be delighted in each other's company. Yeah. Oh, my God. They met on Transylvania 65000 and then went right into The Fly, and then this, and then they got divorced, like, probably right after the movie came out. That may be perfect proof that you should not work with your husband. Yeah. <laughs> because they did make really good movies, and so that wasn't the problem. But, um, yeah, The Fly, boy, that was a great movie, wasn't it? It is. It's one of the best... Yeah, I love anything Goldblum does. He's so just quirky and eccentric, and you can just tell what a great guy he is. You know, and he is absolutely 100% that quirky guy. Like, those quirks are happening whether you're talking to him about something very personal, whether mm -hmm. it's about acting, when he's watching actors perform. He's got, there's, there's, it looks as though he has 47 different channels going on in his head. And by the way, now that I say that out loud, I would guess that Jeff Goldblum is on the spectrum somehow, if not just ADHD like I have. Yeah. Like, it's just, there's so much going on in his head all at the same time. And the fact that he can really zero in and lock down exactly what he's looking for and just just suck you in with his performance, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And, yeah, when I, when I talked to Stacey Travis five years ago, uh, she told me she got, she got this role because... Um, she had been a waitress in a comedy club that her brother Greg had performed at, and Julie Brown used to perform there too, and so she became friends with Julie based on that. Oh, I did not hear that story, and Julie was probably, and it was her movie, but she was probably, and I was, I mean, I was just going to say probably not as friendly as Jeff was and as um, Jim and Damon and Gina. Yep. Now that I think about it, it's probably because she was working, you know, doing a lot of stuff as the writer and probably dealing with the directors and the producers all the time while we were on set, while we were hanging out, messing around and, and goofing off. Uh, her, her, and tu her and Tuesday night have the same manager. Now or then? Now. <laughs> So I grew up with Tuesday because Tuesday dated my brother for a long time when I was little. I don't doubt it. Tuesday dated everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that Tuesday he did. <laughs> I love her. I, yeah, I've, I, I've had her on here four times. Very nice. Yeah, I just adore yeah. her. She's she's so awesome. Yeah, I, I love how in the movie The Aliens, they learn English by watching Jerry Lewis and the Nutty Professor. <laughs> oh, my God, right? Isn't that funny? Yeah. Isn't that funny? And another great actor. Another great star. Yeah. Yeah, God, it was just it's, it's such a great movie. I'll tell you this. When I was 25, um, I was dating this older woman. Her and I didn't have anything in common except the sex that we had was awesome. That's about it. So that's what older women offer you guys. Yes. <laughs> We watched Earth Girls Are Easy one time, and I, it, she could not laugh or smile for most of the movie. But then after uh, Julie does the uh, Because I'm Blonde song, yep. and she does that little Miss America, I want to open a, a, a children's hospital because I love children. Finally, she laughed out loud when she heard that. <laughs> oh, my God. I remember, Tommy, we went to go see the premiere. Mm -hmm. My milk kitchen, my, uh, my manager, and I, and 
he did not think it was funny. Mm-hmm. He did not appreciate any of it. And he buried his head in his hands. He was like, I might be sorry that I had to do this. Mm-hmm. So he did not love it either. And see, it wasn't a big hit, but it had, I'll tell you, I got a $13.78 check for it about four days ago. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had um, honorary withdrawals. I've done honorary withdrawals from SAG and AFTRA when I was probably 25, right before I decided to go to beauty school. Mm-hmm. And never looked back. And then during the pandemic, I was at home and I was talking to all my clients. And as all of your listeners, I'm sure, know that women especially, but also men, have a very different kind of relationship with their hairdressers where they just tell us everything. You've heard yeah. jokes about bartenders and taxi drivers and hairdressers being like psychiatrists and stuff. Oh, yeah. So these people would call me all the time and want to talk about their life, and I would help them color their hair, and a couple of guys were actually cutting their hair on Zoom while I was talking to them. So I decided to start a podcast, and through the podcast, I got a couple of calls from people I went to high school with, and so I decided to reinstate my SAG and after card. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I did, after 30 years, they sent me a very large check because they didn't have my address, and I had residuals for all sorts of shows, Fall Guy, uh, Earth Goes Were Easy, commercials, uh, from uh, all sorts of stuff. And that was a huge, lovely surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, Jazz Dickinson was in the movie, but she was cut, I read. I did not ever meet her there. Yeah. So I don't remember that. Um, but I do. There, so uh, we mentioned Shadow Stevens earlier. And yeah. when I worked with him, he was doing this, I don't know what it was. I think it was a music video. And there were all sorts of older actors, like evil actors, that, that I didn't know, but my father knew who they all were. But the one person I'll never forget working with was Angeline. Oh, okay. And, and she was like, you know, and she's a sci-fi story of her own, right? I mean, yeah. she never really did anything, except she had that husband who just plastered her billboards everywhere. And still, she now lives by me in L.A., and she parks outside the Ralph, and she sells her headshots, and she's got her pantyhose on and her short skirts and her pigtails and her, you know, fancy headbands and her pink Corvette with her name on it. Mm-hmm. And I see her all the time. It's hilarious. Wow. What a coincidence. <laughs> What about what about Lisa Fuller? She that's who I thought you were at first when I was you know uh, contacted you. Yeah, I you know the girls that I worked with again, we were all everybody was nice to each other, but we were more interested in Jeff Goldblum, Gina Davis, Jim Carrey, and Damon Wayans than we were in each other. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think also even though they were blonde, yeah, um, there was still so much competition in that. In the whole ingenue thing in that business, yeah, it's so competitive that most girls aren't really that nice to each other. Yeah. They're just not. And so, um, and I am honestly a woman who is always nice first because I much prefer that. Mm-hmm. But if you're not nice to me, I don't need to be hit in the face twice. I'm like, oh, okay, got your message, I'm out. So it wasn't like the three of us hung out and supported each other in our, you know, eight or nine lines that we had in the movie with these big stars. Right, right. You know, I don't remember anything terrible, but I don't think, it just wasn't commonplace that that young girls in these places looked to become better friends with each other. I don't know why, but um, I think maybe it was just brought out insecurity and that was the last thing you wanted to do when you were trying to get a job. Maybe, I'm not really sure. I can't explain it now. Right, and plus they probably had like a you know an alpha queen um, feel to them, you know, you know of uh, you know every woman for herself, you know, kind of attitude. Yeah. That definitely could have been for sure. Yeah, because I'll tell you, you know, doing this podcast the last six years, I I run into all types of women, and I'll tell you, every woman, <laughs> every woman is different. Every woman has a different point of view than the other. But then there's a group of ones. Who, th- who think that all women think alike and feel the same and all of that stuff. No, every woman is different, um, you know? Uh, my husband would agree with that. <laughs> yes, yes. We are not an easy breed to figure out. That is for certain. Yes, absolutely. What made you, what made you start the podcast? It was just an accident. I was coming off of a car crash, you know. I spent 30 days in a coma. I had been a stand-up comedian for 10 years, not getting anywhere, being treated badly and stuff. And I was just like, 
I'll start a podcast. I was listening to WTF with Mark Marin all the time, and here I am. Well, and, and you must love it. I mean, I know I, I have my own. Yeah. And uh, and I very much enjoy it. And it's funny, did you, uh, did you start off with your niche? Like, did you know you wanted to do sci-fi and horror movies from the 80s? Is that what you always wanted to do? Started out as horror and sci-fi, and then it took on a life of its own of talking to everybody from all genres and music and what have you uh, that I love because... Um, I, I found out pretty quickly that the horror community was one that I, I didn't want to be fully in because they're they're borderline sociopathic and strange and all this um, uh, capitalism concerning the uh, the convention scene is is a, is 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 prevalent and not not something I'm comfortable with fully. So yeah, I just started branching out, talking to everybody, and it's been nothing but a blessing to me. I love hearing that. It's just amazing how many people you can meet from all over the world, and especially now with you know people get to Zoom calls and all that stuff. Yeah, it's just how many people will say yes if you ask? How beautiful is that? It is. It's just it's the it's the greatest blessing of my life. If you had told me you know years ago that this would happen, I would have laughed in your face because it just didn't. There was no signs of it. You know, I mean, I've always been the guy who was great at trivia. I won so many bar trivia contests ten years ago. Everyone hated me for it because I got all the movies and music right always. And you know. Um, I was I would always make jokes during the sex categories because I, I I didn't know all the answers of like the deep science stuff that they would ask you know. So funny. Yeah. And, so, your, and your comedic background obviously played into that a lot too. Exactly. Exactly. So we know how inaccurate IMDb is. Are there any other credits not mentioned that you did? Um. You know. Let me think. Let me think. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are, because I recently went over it again, um, because I recently got back into acting. And so, um, here I am, you know, I just, I just updated that and got myself an agent and, uh, had my first interview the other day. So awesome. I thought that's why I told you I might be on hold because I got a call back, my first interview, which I didn't get, which is fine. But, um, yeah, I think everything is pretty up to date. And I didn't work a whole lot, but, you know, the few jobs that I was lucky enough to go out for and get mm -hmm. were, um, were a great experience for me. And so when somebody asked me to go back into it, I really didn't feel like, oh, I can't do that again. At the time, you know, I don't know how much, I, well, we all know, there's not much longevity to being on Ingenue. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the requirements for it are, are not that big either. So... Um, who knows what would have happened had I stuck with it? Yeah. But being, you know, being an older woman now who is um, so in touch with everything female, I think because I stood behind the chair for so long talking to women. Yeah. Like you said, we're all so different, but I really mm. have a very deep understanding of what makes women tick and um, how to help them, how to hear them, how to uh, be empathetic and compassionate and supportive of them. Uh, you know, that's my new sort of pitch for who I am and what I have to offer out there. Yeah, ironically, you ended up uh, working in salons and spas. <laughs> yeah, there's one. And I, I, you know what, it was, I was always that little girl who did everybody's hair for, you know, prom and on yeah. weekends out to Westwood and even and the truth is, this is kind of silly, when I would get jobs on set and they would do my makeup, I would always redo my makeup in, in my dressing room. I never liked the way anybody did my makeup and I would always just go over it and dip it out and um, never got in trouble for it, but also made sure nobody caught me doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my hair. My hair too. I was just like, no, I, I got this. I'm better at this than you are. <laughs> my my mom is certified in um, cutting hair. Uh, she did that. Oh. She did that before I was born, and then when I was born, she quit working for a couple of years because um, I was I was diagnosed with, you know, some kind of autism at that time, and she 
you know, became a real advocate for uh, kids with disabilities and stuff. And then when she went back to work, she was like, I don't want to work with other women anymore. I want to work with, with men. So she became a, um, a phone operator, which led, led to her uh, working for the cable company through its various names from TCI to Comcast eventually, which wow. she retired under. Yeah, working with more men than women <laughs> and that. She said she said she was never happy working with, with, with women mostly uh, in the salons. You know, the first salon I worked at was all women, and the two salons I worked at after that were mostly uh, straight gay men, mm -hmm. men gay men, and a few women. And um, I can honestly say that I understand your mom's um, lack of interest in the crazy that could happen yeah. with a group of 30 women who work together. And I, um, yeah, it, that, there's no fun in that. It's just not. And there's also no reason for the crazy. They just isn't like, I used to work in a salon out in the valley where I live now, Mm -hmm. on a, the occasional Friday. And if I would come in and they were talking crap up or smack about something that happened the week when I wasn't there, I would yeah. be like, you know what? I wasn't here. Don't want to hear it. Leave me out of it. Um, drama has never been my thing, which might be why I quit acting to begin with. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she just, yeah, in those days too, you know, there weren't a whole lot of uh, gay men out of the closet uh, working in them salons, you know, I'm sure she probably was, was stayed with it, um, had there been, but, um, yeah, it was a completely different time for her and stuff. But, uh, yeah. w what made you want to start the, the Nikki Alpert podcast? So just because I was home and, you know, during lockdown when everybody was in their houses all the time. And like I said, my clients were, um, many hairdressers were doing things like they were dropping hair color off at people's doors and then they would, um, charge them like hundred bucks to drop their color off and they could put their own color on. Mm -hmm. But I sort of felt like my clients had been loyal to me for 27 years and, you know, they had helped me pay for my children to go to college and my mortgage for my house. And I thought, I'm not charging them if I'm not touching their hair. So I would call the beauty supply and I would order the color and I would have my clients go pick it up and I would use their credit card, but of course the beauty supply by them didn't know it was their credit card. So I would, because you can't shop at the, at the hair salon, at the beauty supply places that hairdressers shop at if you're not licensed. So mm -hmm. being that I was licensed, I would order their stuff, I would pay for it with their credit card saying it was mine. Then they would go home and then they would call me and I would help them put their hair color on mm -hmm. while we were on Zoom. And I would help them part their hair off and put it on. And my husband and my kids were like, I can't believe the things people tell you. Like, wow, they tell you so much graphic details about their life. And I was like, have you guys never heard of what happens in a hair salon? Like, really? And my husband said, Nikki, start a podcast. Because you have such interesting conversations that if you could share with people, would make so many other women feel so much more normal. And so these women who think that, like, what they're telling you is something that no one's ever heard before. And I hear 14 people telling you it the same day. And so the first interview I did was with a, um, I had had a dream that I was, run I had this recurring dream, that I'm running down the hall at Beverly High. I have one class to take because I didn't get enough credits in my graduation. And I'm running down the hall looking for my favorite teacher who was, um, in the 80s, he was a psychology teacher, Marty. Mm -hmm. And I find him online and I write him an email, like in the thing where you're applying to see if you can become a patient of his. And he calls me 10 minutes later. He's like, I totally remember you. And he said, let's do this. So we had a whole conversation about what was going to happen to people, you know, post-pandemic and how mm -hmm. traumatic it was going to be and the PTSD and all that stuff. And this is in the beginning. So who knew it was going to last as long as it did? And then, unlike you, I was talking to all sorts of different people because that's what I was used to doing. So I talked to a friend of mine who was the director of The Bachelor and Shark Tank, and because mm. um, I also did some production as a kid, and I worked with Kenny. Kenny Peek is his name. He's a big director now. And we talked about when he had gone back on set and what it was like to work on set during the pandemic. And I just kept talking to all of these different people about life. And I just figured, you know, so many people get paid to not talk at work, and they don't learn enough through people, and it's always been my best in school, I think. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to share these deep conversations that I was having pe with people in my chair, but on the Zoom podcast instead. And um, then as it came along, and really only in the last couple of months when I really decided not to go back to work and to do this instead and to get into acting, I really think that my niche now is, you know, women 40 to death, <laughs> older women, mm -hmm. and this midlife journey that is you know, so different than it was 
you know, with our pride with our grandparents, our grandmothers and our mothers because yeah. who knew we were going to live till 90 or even older. So midlife, is this really midlife? And what it feels like to change and shift and pivot. And I'm finding that uh, a lot of people are more interested in this particular niche, which I guess I knew. But um, I am finding my real niche and really not only moving other people, but it moves me even more. So... That's my new thing. It's just I'm really talking to women about all things middle age, all things menopause, all things anti-aging, all things everything female uh, in women's life journey. I know. I mean, I've watched the, uh, the the ones where you talk about sex. And I really like that. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm one of the few pop culture podcasts out there that does uh, sex episodes because. Uh, I'm disabled, and I want uh, people to know that disabled people are sexual, too, and that we love sex, yeah. and it's not explored very often, you know? Um, every May, I do a month-long block where I have all my like-minded guests that have been on before that I'm good friends with come on, and we, we share our sex lives and have talks about it and stuff, and I'll get, like, sex experts coming on for the first time or porn stars, and we'll just talk about it, you know? That's interesting. And so, when you say you're disabled, do you mean because, because of what, because your car accident? Oh, yeah, I mean, I got lots of things wrong with me, you know, I got Asperger's, I got scoliosis that I struggled with for most of my life, and then um, my accidents, I had so much done to me, broke my leg in seven places, had a stent placed in my heart because I had a heart attack, I crushed, my, I crushed my sternum, severed my aorta, lots of things, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to be alive now. I'm so glad to hear you say that instead of being a victim. Good for you, Tommy. Yeah, I mean, I talk about it all the time, even even to, you know, add, add exhaustion because so many people think of me as an anom anomaly, and so I have to, like, you know, tell them about it all the time. Yeah, I mean, listen, I have people who, um, when they find out that I'm a type 1 diabetic, there is the... Uh, I have that, too, really yeah. Oh, you're type two? That's what type two, about. yeah. Uh, and you're getting your A1C check tomorrow, right? On uh, Thursday. On Thursday. Yeah, so I, I have people who, you know, some people who pity me, and I'm like, look, I have to be honest with you. Um, I kick diabetes' ass every single day. There are moments in some days where it tries to kick mine, but I bounce right back. And I think I'm a better person because of it. I think it has made me more empathetic and compassionate with whatever anybody else might be dealing with that I don't see and I don't know. You know, and we all have our struggles, and uh, you pretty much get what you can handle, I think. And I can handle this, and clearly, you can handle your struggles, and you've turned it into something that is working for you, not against you. And I, I freaking love that, Tommy. I love it. Oh, yeah. It's been really adventurous, and it's going to continue being adventurous. That's the way I look at it. I mean, look, and as far as sex goes, uh, you know, I'm, I have this thing, it's a DESCOM 6, and it's a... Um, it's a, it's a glucose meter that is attached to me, so a constant glucose meter. Mm -hmm. It dings and it dings and it rings bells when my sugar drops and raises. And the noises I make all day long from my phone that beep and whistle and my husband is like, it's like having sex with a video game. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the circus. Because I, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, we got to stop. I got to get some skittles or I got to get some gummy bears or I got to get some meat. And then he's like, all right, I'll be here when you're done. <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious! I speaking yeah. speaking of spas, I had sex in a hot tub spa once. I think, and you know, the gross thing about that Tommy, you're probably not the first person to have had sex in that hot tub spa. Yeah, well, I'll tell I'll tell you something. <laughs> it's a good cautionary tale. I tell every guy this, guys. Don't get into the hot tub until after the sex. Don't do it beforehand because you will not maintain a hard on. I'll tell you. <laughs> I never have to worry about that, and I and so so guys, I'm glad you're listening to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a I'm a absolute freak. You know, I've dated a lot of older women. I went to cougar parties in my twenties. You know, I was that guy that swinger couples would ask to join the fun. You know, I'm into exhibitionism and voyeurism and kink and fetish, all that stuff. That is so not my my thing, but but as long as you love it, it's good for you. Yeah, I mean, I haven't I haven't had sex uh, since my accident, you know, and in the last eight years, you know, I've done more masturbating than I did in junior high. <laughs> as long as you're getting something done, good for you. It's been crazy. 
Yeah. Do you have any upcoming episodes of your podcast that explores any deep topics uh, coming soon? Um, uh, well, something I'm not sure you would love, but I am. there's a woman that I met online who uh, is talking about her menopausal journey and how what she found that saved her life, and I think that's really incredible. I recently did one with Dr. Erica Anderson, who is a trans woman, and we were talking about what's happening in the trans world today mm-hmm. and her take on it as she transitioned when she was in her late 60s after being married and having two children and really thinking about the transition as opposed to what some doctors are allowing now where women or men decide that they want to uh, become something other or become who they are, you know, and starting at 14. And Dr. Erica was like, yeah, I think we need some more time to think about it and have therapy around it and all that stuff. And I, um, I learned a lot from her and, um, Again, most of my things are just, uh, you know, that, that, I think that helped a lot of women my age who have children who are dealing with this kind of thing because everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who has trans kids. And it is big news these days, and I think it's worth learning as much as we can about because there are so many reasons people are being horrible to everybody, and this should not be anything that people don't get respect for, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so anything I can do to help people feel better about what they're dealing with mm-hmm. is always my goal. And it's funny because I don't really ever, I did one on diabetes, but yeah. only because the guy wrote a great book that I was interested in. But I don't want to be that woman. I don't want to be the woman that's identified by my diabetes. And so I, I, I'm happy to talk about it and help people, which I've always done. If somebody wants to talk about what I do that works and how I can help them. But I, but being a diabetic podcaster is so not my thing. <laughs> oh yeah I mean you don't want to just do one topic you know you want to explore everything yeah just keep learning which I think is all about how we stay relevant as we age you know just keep learning and, and finding out as much as you can about as many things as you can absolutely that episode with the vaginal chair was so great <laughs> oh my god with my friend Randy so it's called it's called the Amcella but the woman mm-hmm. who I asked, who I interviewed before about vaginal rejuvenation is a, is a spokesperson. She goes around the around the world talking about the Amstella chair, and she um, coined the phrase the Kegel throne. Yeah. And a lot of women I know are using that for all sorts of reasons. And um, I haven't done it yet, but I certainly plan to at some point just see what it's like. It's supposed to be very helpful for all, all sorts of things, pelvic floor rejuvenation. And, and it works for men also, because none have pelvic floors, whether you guys know it or not, you do. And it works for all sorts of things. Yeah. Oh, I, I wouldn't even mind getting one of those. <laughs> yeah, listen, it's good. I mean, people, as you get older, you have with war weekends, and you don't want to be that guy who needs a diaper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we got to play my secret silly game. This is a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose, just pure fun. And okay. how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question, and I answer it. And feel free to come on, on answers because they might be funny. Okay, let's do that. Okay, Nikki, are you ticklish? I am. Uh, Tommy, are you ticklish? Oh, yes. If you tickle me without warning, though, I might hit you in the groin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, is your belly button a ninny or an Audi? It's an inny. What about yours, Tommy? It's an inny. Okay. Um, what color are your toenails painted? Pink, but like a light natural pink. Love it. Are yours painted? They're not painted right now, but last time they were, they were uh, Easter egg blue. I like that. Yeah, kind of a blue green. I like to go elaborate. Um, what would you say is your best personality trait? That I am kind and um, supportive. That too. I do agree. Aw, thank you. What's your best personality trait? I have empathy, and I have no filter. I love those. I, love, and I, I, would, I would add those to my list. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a Gemini, so I got two twins. Uh, I'm a Pisces, so I'm two fish, but we come in different directions. Oh, my parents are Pisces. There you go. Yeah, my mom's February 21st, and my dad's March 4th. February 23rd. Wow. <laughs> two days after right my mom. Mama. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Try, oh, yeah. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? So many. Oh, my God, Tommy. My nose 
Mm-hmm. Literally, like, if you walk in the house and I'm upstairs in the farthest point away from where you walk in the front door and you had onions, uh-huh. I can smell it. If you had a burger, I can smell it. If you didn't take out the trash, I lose my shit. I have such a horrific sense of smell that anything makes me just uh, bad smells. And also, like, you know, too much of even a good smell is not a good thing for me. I, my smell factory, my, my old factory is, it's a curse. Yeah. It's a total curse. What about you? Uh, either farts or feet. Yeah, two things I have no interest in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have some jokes for you. Okay, oh, wait a minute, though. Do you have noticed that doggy feet always smell um, like Fritos? I don't smell them, sorry. <laughs> so you know what? You would like them. Doggy feet always smell like Fritos. I don't know what it is, but go ahead. What's your joke? Interesting. Let's see. What do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? A girl? A liar. A liar, okay. <laughs> Everyone's always trying to guess that punchline. They never get it right. All right. Uh, you know the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? Do you is the question. <laughs> yes. A man rather spend 20 minutes looking for a golf ball. Exactly. There you go. I hate golf, by the way. I never play it. Me neither. It's boring. I don't like I don't like mini golf, but I don't like golf. No, thank you. Too long, too boring. George George Carlin once said, "Have you ever watched golf? It's like watching flies fuck." <laughs> uh, it, uh, could you imagine? And yeah, golf. I don't understand. And so many people I know love it. I don't get it. I like driving a golf cart though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind being Chevy Chase in a golf cart. That I can do. Oh yeah, I, I did that uh, when I came back from my accident. I was riding those golf carts that they give you at the grocery store and driving my mom crazy because she thought I was going to crash into something. <laughs> oh my God! I remember Tommy when kids were little and we had those shopping carts that had the little steering wheels in them for the mm-hmm. kids to sit in. And I have twins, and they were probably two and a half, and they weren't very verbal. They were like, you know, up, mommy, up, ooh, mommy, playing, things like that. And we're driving to the market and. A lady cuts me off, and I was frustrated, and, I, and I'm waiting for her to move, and she's not moving, and finally I just scream out like an idiot, move it, asshole, and finally I park, and I put the kids in the, in the, in the basket with the steering wheels, and we're driving, we're, we're in the market, and we're going down the aisle, and my kids are pretending to drive, and there's a little boy who comes down the opposite way facing us with his little cart with the driving, with the steering wheel, and he goes, beep, beep. Hello? Uh, uh, Move it, uh, asshole! And I was like, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> Thank God the lady was, I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I just said that in the car, and I, they never repeated that. She was like, oh, he's got an eight-year-old brother. You should hear the stuff he says. And I was like, oh, thank you so much for being so nice. I'm so embarrassed. She's like, oh, my God, sweetheart, don't be embarrassed. And we are friends till this day. <laughs> Nikki, thank you so much for coming on and having this fun chat here today. Tell me, I enjoyed myself tremendously. Thank you so much for asking. Absolutely, and I'll keep watching your podcast. And I just, I just love this, you know, childlike quality you have. You're so curious, and you're just so much fun, and it's, it's great to watch. So I'll keep watching it, and you have yourself a, gr- a great day, and be safe out there. Oh, Tommy, your words put a smile in my heart, and I am so grateful for the time and your time alone. Thank you so much, and I'll watch yours and look for more of my friends, and I'll go watch Claudia as soon as I can, or listen. Thank you, thank you. Have a beautiful day, honey. Thanks again. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Well, there you have it. Nikki Kramer Alpert. Isn't she a sweetheart? Ah, oh, that was that was a great conversation. I'm so glad that we could talk about the the work that she did and the podcast. Go check it out, the Nikki Albert podcast. It's pretty cool. Deep stuff on there. Deep stuff. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire dudes. <laughs>